good morning, everybody. My name again is Joe Stanton. Um, I'm Assistant Director of North Carolina Emergency Management. Uh, my uh, forte and what I really oversee for the state is recovery as it pertains to recovery from uh, disasters. I've been doing this for about um, around 15 to 16 years now uh, for the state. And I have some excellent knowledge with me today. Uh, Robin Dell is our area coordinator uh, for this area. Uh, she has served uh, in this capacity for many years and has a great knowledge of emergency management as it pertains uh, to not only the state role, but also the regional and local role. Um, and her expertise is followed also in communications, which is a huge part of emergency management. Next is Brent Fisher. Brent um, is or works with Nash County Emergency Management. He's the Assistant Director of Emergency Management. Um, his role pertains to uh, more of the county and local, and he is considered one of the leaders in North Carolina um, in emergency management, if not throughout the country. So with that, we're going to start because disasters begin and end at the local level. We're going to start with Brent Fisher. Thank you. And I want to thank them for both volunteering to be here today. I didn't have much choice because my wife told me I had to be here. <laughs> they did volunteer. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Stanton said, I'm Brent Fisher. I'm the Assistant Director of Fire Marshal and Emergency Management here in Nash County. Um, I've just, September, I've just obtained 25 years with the county. Um, I know I look uh, much older than I am, but uh, it's disastrous to do that to you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I have been with the county for 25 years. I actually started out in the 911 Center in 1993. Uh, as a 911 telecommunicator. As Mr. Stanton said, when do, where does disaster start? Locally. Locally. And a lot of times, where does that first phone call go to? 911, <laughs> right? And then it's processed from there. We start sending resources out, responders out, things like that. So 911, we call them our first, first responders. You may not see them on the scene, but they're there because they're the ones that are taking the call, fielding the call, and passing the information along, notifying the appropriate agencies, or whatever the need may be. Uh, so that's where I started out in, 911. Uh, then I had the opportunity a few years later to move over to the fire marshal's office. So what do you think a fire marshal does in a day to day? You know? How do we know that this room is safe for you to come here today and occupy this room? How do you know this building is safe for you to come here and occupy this building and attend class here? Well, that's charged by general statute of North Carolina that uh, we have fire marshals in every county and every jurisdiction that go out and do court code enforcement, okay? Where's your, where's your exit at in this room? Where would you exit if, if a fire broke out in this room? Where would you go? Which door would you go out of? Why that one? It leads to the outside. What else? What's above the door? Exit. What about the one you came in? That's an exit too, right? So how do we make sure that these exit doors are safe for us to exit out of in case of emergency? Code enforcement. So we go out and do code enforcement on buildings uh, throughout the county. We don't have jurisdiction in one and two family homes, but any other property in the county, we have jurisdiction in to go and make sure that the uh, that buildings are safe. You may want to write this down. Uh, code enforcement started because of an incident that took place in Hamlet, North Carolina, at a chicken processing plant. Okay? Find out the date that that occurred. Find out some information on what stirred fire code enforcement uh, in, in the state of North Carolina. There were fatalities involved in that fire, okay? 
People went to an exit door and couldn't get out because it was padlocked shut. They went to doors because on the other side of the door because of some things going on, and I want you to learn the background of that. There were some things going on internally of the chicken processing plant that they had vehicles parked up against the door so you couldn't get out. And people died right there at the door, okay, because they couldn't get out. Another one I want you to look at is the Rhode Island nightclub fire that took place in Rhode Island. There's actually a YouTube video on that that actually shows uh, a band up performing on stage and uh, a fire starts on the stage and within several minutes of the fire uh, starting, the whole building is on fire and people are trapped inside. Okay? It's a lot of gruesome stuff that you'll see in disasters. But that's what code enforcement does. As we go out to try and make these buildings and these facilities as safe as possible, nursing homes, group homes, uh, churches, uh, the mall, Chick-fil-A. How many of you like good Chick-fil-A? Okay, Chick-fil-A. We've got to make sure these places are safe for you to go and spend money and eat and be with friends and things like that. Okay. So I do that day to day, but I also do uh, fire investigations. So if a fire breaks out in your home, in a business, we have to go out and do an investigation to determine what was the cause and origin of that fire. Okay. So after I did that for a few years, I moved over to emergency management. Stayed in the same office, just changed job titles, job descriptions, uh, job duties. So I started in emergency management. What is emergency management? What do y'all think emergency management is? You hear it all the time on TV, right? So what do you think emergency management does or is? Provides help during times of... They support people like after like emergencies like hurricanes or tornadoes. Okay, good. What else? That's a lot of what we do. There's a lot of things that go on before a disaster, during a disaster, and after disaster, and that's what we're going to talk about. Emergency management, uh, to, to me, is, is what I'm, I'm more genuine about. I'm, I'm genuine about fire code enforcement and emergency management, but emergency management opens up the door to a whole lot of things. So if you think you're going to get in emergency management and go sit in, a, in an office one day and just sit and do the same thing, day after day after day, you're not. It's something new every single day. Things change all the time. So I've been in emergency management since 2006. Um, seen many disasters from tornadoes, snowstorms, uh, hurricanes, uh, flooding, things like that. So that's part of the emergency management response. So my education is I graduated from NC State University. How many are Tar Heel fans? Me too, I'm a Tar Heel fan, but I graduated from NC State. <laughs> Sat right in class with a Carolina blue shirt on. No, I did, because you got, you got to be careful. But uh, I did go to state, graduated with a landscaping degree. And now I'm an emergency manager, how about that? So then I went to Wilson Tech and uh, got my fire science degree, which really stirred the interest in emergency management as I got to thinking and going through fire science because fire departments, rescue departments are involved in emergency management as well. So that got me stirred up in emergency management and when the opportunity came about, I jumped on it and took it. Um, currently I'm going to Western Carolina to get my uh, four year degree in emergency management. Uh, I'm hoping to finish that pretty soon. So uh, that's online. I like sitting in a classroom like y'all are uh, because of networking, because of discussions, but because of my work schedule and my three small children, online works better for me. So that's my education background. So day to day, what do you think I do in the course of my day? As an emergency manager in Nash County, what do you think my day to day job is? Receive Receive phone calls? Yes. What else? What kind of phone calls do you think? Dealing with? Okay. Yes. Yep. So those, those are good answers. Anybody else? 
So two things I wanted to, I wrote down as I was making some notes here. Day-to-day -day versus disaster day. Day-to-day, -day, I'm sitting in my office and I'm planning. There's a lot of planning that goes on with emergency management. Um, emergency operations plans. How many of you have an emergency plan at home? How, do you, how many of you know how to get out of your home if a disaster strikes at home? That's an emergency plan. Well, let's take it a couple steps further. What happens if a tornado hits? What happens if your street gets flooded? What do you do? How do you get out? How do you get notified? How do you communicate with your family? So I have to do that for the whole county. I have to think about that not only for my family, but for the county as a, as a whole. How are we going to respond if we have another Hurricane Floyd or Hurricane Matthew and we have 20 some inches of rain and the, the river has uh, flooded the streets? What are we going to do? How are we going to get resources in? We've got people sitting on rooftop needing rescue. Where are we going to get the resources for rescue at? So I, there's a lot of planning that goes on bless you, before an event even happens. So we have to prepare for those. So day to day, that's what I'm doing, preparing. I'm networking. Networking is big in emergency management because do we have all the resources and all the answers here in Nash County? No. But you gotta know where to reach out to get those resources. You gotta reach out and know those people that you can call on to come in and help, okay? So networking is big. That's probably one of the biggest things that I do is network and relationship building and understanding the agencies that I can call upon and what they can do for us in time of need. Um, working with our partners. Partners are who? I'm sorry? Other counties. Other counties, that's right. Municipalities, counties, the state, the federal government, working with those partners. Now, a few years ago, Interstate 95 is right down the road here. We had the interstate shut down for 23 hours. What goes up and down that interstate every single day? Cars, trucks, commerce, money. You know, when we shut down the interstate, products can't get from point A to point B, okay, without it being affected in some form or fashion. Having a hazmat spill out there on the interstate with a chemical that we don't know what it is and it takes us about 30, 45 minutes to figure out what it is and then we got to evacuate areas, we've got to set up detour routes, things like that. Uh, the time to get to know those people, those agencies that can come in and help is not at two o'clock in the morning standing on the side of Interstate 95 shaking hands and saying, who are you, I'm so and so and what can you do to help support this incident? That's today. That's what I do day to day, is preparation for those types of disasters, networking and building those relationships with those agencies that we may have to call upon. Okay? So that's what a lot that I do day to day. The county has an emergency operations plan. I have to make sure that it's in a state of readiness. You know, the sheriff's office, what is their roles and responsibilities when it comes to disasters? Public health. What's public health's role and responsibility when it comes to a disaster? Social services, same thing. So it doesn't just stop at fire rescue or emergency management, but there's other agencies that have to step up when a disaster strikes to help out and lend a helping hand. Okay? So during a disaster, uh, again, working with partners, relationship building, Again, the disaster begins and ends locally. Um, coordination of resources is very big during disasters. General Statute 166A, y'all might want to write that one down. North Carolina General Statute 166A is the Emergency Management Act here in North Carolina. That's what gives us our roles and responsibilities and respons responsibilities at a local level, but also the state level and also federal level on uh, disaster response. Okay, tells what the governor can do, tells what the county commissioners can do, tells what the local emergency manager can do, tells what a mayor can do. Okay, so General Statute 166A. So in that coordination of resources and supplying information to the state, to my area coordinator, Ms. Dale here, 
every day we're in conversation, whether through email, uh, through WebEOC, which is a situation uh, crisis management uh, solution that the state uses uh, for all counties to communicate with the state on resource needs, situation reports of what's going on in the counties and the uh, municipalities that are in the county, uh, and what resources we might need to to support the incident that's, or disaster that we have at hand. Um, again, coordination response, public and private, is very big uh, in any county. Again, we don't have all the resources in Nash County. Rocky Mount doesn't have all the resources that we need, so we have to be able to put in resource requests. The state's going to want to know what we need those resources for, how long we need those resources for, um, and what, what is the urgent need. General Statute 166A uh, also says that if a disaster is occurring in a county, the county reaches out to the municipalities at the local level finds out what their needs, so all that's coordinated through the county. And then the counties are responsible to coordinate with the state. So a little quiz here, how many counties are in the state of North Carolina? 100. But there's 101 jurisdictions that the state works with. What's the 101st? I'm sorry? It's in the mountains. It's the Eastern Band Cherokee Indians, right? So they make up that's 101 jurisdictions that report to the camp to the state whenever there's times of disaster, and we work with each of us work together uh, during those times of, uh, of need. So if every municipality or every county had seven municipalities in their county, so we got 100 counties times seven, that's what? 700 jurisdictions, right? They could be reaching out to the state saying, I need a prime mover, I need a search and rescue team, I need a helicopter to come in and assist with removal of people from rooftops because the roads have flooded. And we can't get resources in and out. We need boats. So that's 700 things that could be asked for. So if Rocky Mount asked for that and, and Nash County asked for that, we could have duplication of resources that occurred. And in that duplication of resources, what does that cost? It costs money, right? So how are we going to pay for all that stuff? That's when we called Mr. Stanton here <laughs> to help us pay for everything. But uh, that, that could happen. And that's why we funnel everything through the county so we don't have duplication of efforts and duplication of resources because those resources are costing money. Okay. And then we've got we to gotta go through the reimbursement process. So when a disaster does strike, we're sending teams out and doing windshield surveys because how do we know what areas are impacted in the county? Where do we know where the greatest need is in the county? Where do we know that we need to set up a shelter because people don't have anywhere else to go that we need to set up a shelter somewhere? So we have the fire departments out there. We have law enforcement out there doing windshield surveys for us, telling us what kind of damage they're seeing out there in the county. They're relaying that back to the emergency operations center, which is another responsibility of mine is to make sure that our EOC, emergency operations center, is up and running and is facilitating all of these. So when we collect this data, we're sending it to the state so they have a, a picture of what's occurring in the county. They gather that information and they give it to the governor so when the governor gets, stands up and gives a press conference, he has some idea of what's going on in the state of North Carolina. Okay? Again, that comes from the locals. It comes from agencies out there that, that respond to the, to the federal and state level, but also at the local level. Okay? So we're providing that information and those resources. I'm going to turn it over to Robin. We're going to be talking back and forth here, but I'm going to turn it over to Robin if she wants to come up and, and explain what she does day to day with emergency management and how she helps Nash County because she is a one of our partners and uh, there's a lot of things that I couldn't do day to day without her help. So I appreciate her uh, being here. Well, I appreciate you. Yep, thank you. And my name is Robin Dale. I'm with North Carolina Emergency Management. I'm an area coordinator. Area coordinators are um, the liaisons between the county and the state. 
how I got here was um, back in the day, I was in the private sector. Does everybody know what the private sector is? That means it's the business world, not the government world. And um, I decided one day when my husband told me that he was going to become a member of the local fire department, I said, well, do you think I could do that? And he said, well, we can't find out until you try. So at age 42, I became a certified firefighter at a local volunteer fire department. Then I got the bug so bad that I wanted to do more than that. I became a 911 telecommunicator in a small county called Person County, if you are familiar with that. After that, my husband decided to move, so I went from different 911 centers, depending upon where he was moving because he was a law enforcement officer, and wherever he served, we had to live in that jurisdiction. So I spent a little bit more time in the 911 center. I had a friend who had started with the North Carolina State Emergency Management 24-hour operations center. The easiest way to explain that to you is that the 24-hour operations center is kind of like 911, but it's for the counties to call. So instead of you or your mother or your neighbor calling 911, and getting a 911 center to get fire trucks, ambulances, and law enforcement, the state provides the counties with resources that they don't have that are above and beyond their lo local capabilities of law enforcement, fire trucks, and ambulances. So I worked there for about 10 years. I enjoyed doing it so much that I wanted to do more. I worked a lot with area coordinators and helping them uh, get the information from the local counties to what their responsibilities are and I said that's what I want to do that's what I want to be when I grow up so I've been in this capacity with the state for about two years prior to that I was a field planner which I helped the counties out doing their emergency operations plans sheltering plans any kind of plans that they might need help on Going back a little bit, you never heard me say anything about me having a college degree. I do not have a college degree. However, I took as much training as I possibly could wherever I was. I was in my books. I was talking to people. I was networking to get the information that I needed to be a successful member of the team that I am on now. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't aspire and work really hard and diligently to get your college degree because it will help you more than I can tell you because there are a lot of times that I said, hey, if I had my college degree, I could have that job. I would have had that job four years ago. I would have had that job five years ago. So make sure that you're in your books, you're learning, and you're networking, okay? So now getting into a little bit more of what I do as an area coordinator. I'm a liaison between the counties to the state to get them resources that they need. I'm also the liaison between FEMA and the counties. So my responsibilities are twofold. I help this side of the house and I help that side of the house. And my job is to make sure that no matter what the counties need, I'm the expert on knowing who I can get to help them. So whether it's a federal resource or it's a local resource or a state resource, I can help who's ever asking me for help. I can get them what they need. My current counties are Wake, Johnston, Edgecombe, Wilson, Carnett, and Nash. I'm the Area 7 coordinator. Those are the uh, seven counties for the six counties in area seven. State has divided the state up into three different branches. There's the eastern, western, and central branch. And each one of those branches have divided up the areas five each. So that means there are 15 area coordinators. So there's 15 of us taking care of anywhere from six to seven counties on a daily basis. That's the way we divide up our workload. Um, the primary responsibility on a day-to-day -day for an area coordinator is to make sure 
that I've got the counties anything and everything that they possibly need so that when they have a disaster, they have the resources that they need to either respond to that or prepare for it to happen. Who knows what the four phases of emergency management are? I know this is part of your class. I saw it. Somebody's got to know at least one of them. You prepare, right? You respond, you recover. Somebody come on, help me out here. Plan. You plan, okay. Yeah, well, you also have to mitigate, and that's usually not within the four phases. So mitigation is an extremely important part of emergency management. So I want you to put that down because a lot of times you'll only see the four phases, okay? During blue skies, my responsibility, like I said, is to make sure the counties are taken care of. I talk to them on a daily basis. I go and, and reach out to them at their um, offices. If they need anything, I'm there to help them. Other than that, when it comes to disaster responses, I go to what is called the Regional Coordination Center, and the Regional Coordination Center for the Central Branch is in Butner, North Carolina. That's also in Granville County. What happens there is through the course of all the counties figuring out what they might need in response to a hurricane or an ice storm or any kind of natural man-made disaster, all of their resource requests will go into that database, which we, Brent was talking to about, and Mr. Fisher was talking about earlier, called Web EOC. And when I'm there, it's my responsibility to make sure that I look at those requests and I determine how important it is for them to get what they need and where we're going to get those from. So that's my primary responsibility in the um, Regional Coordination Center. Should a county have an incident that's just local to them and they need a resource such as uh, um, uh, RRT, which is a regional um, response, it's a, a technical response team, a hazmat team, they will call the 24 operations center where I used to work. They will say, hey, I need help. Please send me an RRT. When those are requested, it's always the responsibility of an area coordinator to respond with that resource. They have USAR teams, the urgent urban search and rescue teams that I'm required to respond with. Same way as any kind of state resource that goes on scene to a local incident, I'm required to um, respond with that. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. I can't steps, hear you. The four steps, what were they? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What were the four steps? The four phases? Did I miss one? I just didn't hear you. Prepare, respond, recover, mitigate, and why am I blanking out? <clears throat> Plan is not really. Uh, prepare, respond, recover, mitigate. Sorry, okay, that's the four. I apologize. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, one sec. Uh, what happens if you can't, like, someone needs a resource and you can't find anyone to get them that resource? That doesn't happen very often because the state has an overwhelming um, capability of providing whatever resource, North Carolina specifically, um, because of all the different catastrophes or incidents or natural disasters that can happen in North Carolina, we have a huge um, resource reserve of almost any type of response that would be needed. Um, we are so good at what we do, and I like to brag about North Carolina, we're so good at what we do, other states call us. We have been to Puerto Rico to help them to recover from the hurricane. We have been to Hawaii to help them recover from um, or plan and process through the volcanoes. Now, we don't have volcanoes in North Carolina, but because we're so good at responding to disasters, 
they call us and have us come in and help them recover from those types of incidents. So I don't really know of anything. If we don't have anything specific, we have ways of getting them through the Emergency Management Assistance Compact or EMAC. You might want to look that up. Um, that's where states provide mutual aid to each other, just like fire departments provide mutual aid to each other. States have the same type of mutual aid contracts. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, also, like, how like extreme would y'all go to like, so if like only one person was like trapped in a flood, like would y'all like fly helicopters and stuff to see that one person? Yes, we have what's called the North Carolina Hilo Aquatic Rescue Teams. And what those are, are helicopters, and they have um, rescue technicians that will fly with those helicopters. It's either through the Highway Patrol or National Guard. And we don't really fly on the um, Coast Guard helicopters, but we have access to those helicopters as well. And if there's just one person in the river, we can send a Hilo Aquatic Rescue Team out to get that one person out of the river. Anyone else? Can, can we just pause questions for a minute and let Mr. Staten go because we're on a oh, okay. different schedule with Club Day. So we'll get questions at the end if we have time. I just want them to hear from Colin. <laughs> about recovery operations and that's pretty much uh, under my gamut. Uh, as assistant director I oversee the recovery programs for the state of North Carolina uh, and part of that is uh, helping communities after the disaster uh, with individuals and also uh, getting reimbursement for different types of programs. So, what I wanted to talk about was just the policies and guides, and we mentioned some of that, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, I won't spend too much time on individual assistance, but I do want to talk about it um, and what our roles are. You know, the state recovery role is we're the point of contact for disaster recovery preparedness uh, for all our partners. We coordinate development and training of recovery training. We establish and maintain the networks and we strengthen recovery initiatives. The public assistance program is the program that basically helps to pay for damages of infrastructure after a disaster. It could be schools. It would be this school if it wasn't insured. You know, we hope that this, you know, Nash Community College has very good insurance. And so if a hurricane hits this facility, and damages it, the first thing we want to make sure is that insurance pays for it. And then we would seek uh, probably federal assistance to pay for the rest of uh, a portion of it. And federal assistance usually in the state of North Carolina with FEMA at the current time usually runs 75% federal government and 25% local government. So the state pays 25% of every dollar that occurs in public assistance disasters. Now, let's take Hurricane Florence, which was our last hurricane. That is about a $900 million disaster for public assistance. So the state is on the hook for 25% of that. That's a lot of money. And so we have to be very careful to be able to count our, our dollars to ensure that the state is getting uh, what it's asked for and everything is correct. Plus, we're going to get audited. And if we do not pass the audit, what happens is we get fined and we also could get uh, bills for additional uh, funding that they feel that we went in excess of. 
Individual assistance. Individual assistance is assistance to just that, individuals. Um, it could be housing. You know, in North Carolina right now, with Hurricane Florence, we have uh, individuals that went and registered. They received some dollars for rental assistance. We have people living in hotels. We have about, oh, about six to 700 families in North Carolina right now that homes are damaged and they're still in hotels. And they've been in hotels pretty much since the shelters have shut down. We have what is called the STEP program, which is a, a, a temporary sheltering program where we are putting people back into homes, but we're not really repairing their whole home. The only thing we're doing pretty much is getting that home to the bare minimum that allows them to live in. We're not painting the walls. We're not putting carpet down on the floors. We're not even fixing the bathrooms or the kitchens really up to standard. We're just making sure that they work and then we're moving the person back into their home. Later on, through some other programs that the state and FEMA has, we can do more extensive types of repairs. But this allows, let's say you're a senior citizen, this allows that senior citizen to get back into that community, to get closer to their doctors, closer to their post office, closer to their church and their connections so that they can start in their recovery efforts. So the program's been pretty successful. We also have mobile homes that we're placing in mobile home parks, and we also have travel trailers. We have currently around 600 and some travel trailers throughout North Carolina right now that people are actually living in. And they've been living in them since about the third week after the disaster. And they can live in these travel trailers for up to 18 months. Besides that, we have paid for a large number of funerals. We have paid for medical bills. We have paid for lost medical items such as wheelchairs and other things that uh, they couldn't get replaced. And, and other items, it's called other needs assistance. Really, what we're trying to do is we're not gonna put the person back to uh, almost the way they were before, but we are going to give them the bare minimum. Finally, hazard mitigation. Hazard mitigation is a, a way that we go in and we try to repair something so it won't happen again. How many of y'all have been to the Frisbee golf course in Rocky Mount? That used to be, that golf course in Rocky Mount used to have homes all throughout it. You know, it was covered in homes. And what happened was during Floyd, all that area was flooded. So FEMA and Rocky Mount went in and purchased all that land, turned it over to the city of Rocky Mount for, so they have to maintain it forever. But they can never build back on that property because we don't want to have people living in the floodway. And that's part of hazard mitigation. And that's also under one of the recovery programs. Now, here you see the phases of emergency management. Uh, mitigation, recovery, preparedness, and response. What we like to say in recovery is that they really overlap. You really can't have recovery without response. You really can't have preparedness without mitigation. They're all together. And there's different phases. You know, first we're going to respond, then we're going to move into a stabilization period. We're going to put people in shelters. Very soon, you know, schools open up sometimes, they're the shelters. Uh, churches are, are sometimes the shelters. And then we get into the intermediate phase of recovery, and that's where we're like kind of move, removing debris, and you see those trucks picking up the debris that's been brought out on the streets and there's other activities that are going on 
Um, and then we get into long-term recovery. That's when we're starting to demolish homes and rebuild. It takes a while to rebuild uh, public works and other types of facilities that have been damaged. And then we get into redevelopment. And redevelopment is more of a long-term. It could take five to 10 years. In fact, Hurricane Floyd, which happened in 1999 in the state of North Carolina, was not closed until like three years ago. It had projects ongoing. And here you see some of the flooding um, in North Carolina. This is a public works uh, a water treatment plant down in, I think it was around Kinston, that we had to mitigate uh, so it wouldn't flood again. It cost us around 30 to 40 million dollars to mitigate this facility. Policies and guidance, we talked some about uh, what 166A, you need to have a basic understanding of that. The state in disaster recovery takes its lead and follows the National Disaster Recovery Framework. Take a look at that. In that, there's about six different items in the Disaster Recovery Framework dealing with all types of programs, whether it's housing, whether it's environmental, whether um, it is emergency management. The state has developed a recovery framework. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, the governor has actually endorsed our recovery framework and is actually having full-time people assigned to oversee the recovery framework because it's a way to assist us to rebuild, recover more efficiently and effectively. Now all of this is a partnership. And we hear a lot of things and you probably have some opinions in a lot of some of the things you've read about FEMA coming in and leaving very quickly, and the state coming in and, and then leaving very quickly. It's all of us. It takes, FEMA by itself cannot do it. HUD by itself is not responsible for everybody. The state of North Carolina, after in recovery is not necessarily responsible for total recovery. It takes everybody. It takes your efforts. It takes everybody sitting down together, hopefully ahead of time, and doing what you all are doing between now and to the end of school year, coming up with unique solutions on how that we can maybe recover better and be more resilient. So when the next disaster hits, we'll be more prepared and be able to come up with a unique solution. And so, you know, in our recovery planning, we work with a lot of different organizations. We work with agriculture, we work with environmental, we work with cultural resources. We work with a lot of volunteers. In fact, the STEP program, instead of just bringing contractors in to do the repairs of homes, we're using the United Methodist, the Baptist on Missions, and other volunteer organizations. Because in a lot of areas, contractors do not want to go into those areas to make repairs. So we depend a lot on the volunteers. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to some questions that you may have on emergency management, some of the things that y'all thought about. So are there any questions? Yes. What are some common problems in emergency management? Yeah, common problems in emergency management. There's lots of problems. Uh, we're understaffed. FEMA's understaffed. We're underfunded. You know. Plus, we have a habit of um, sometimes. You know how we do. We we get used to doing things, 
and the world is changing, and sometimes we don't adapt to the changes of the world. We, we need to be constantly improving and constantly looking at ways we can improve. If not, we sometimes get behind the curve because of that. How has your job been affected since the government shut down? You know, I have about, uh, it, it hasn't really, you know, to a certain degree, uh, but it has. I have about a thousand people. I work in, right now, my office is in a, what is called a joint field office. I work in Durham, North Carolina right now in a facility that's about a hundred thousand square foot building. And I have about a thousand FEMA people that I work with and then, you know, only about a couple of hundred state people that I work with. What happens is, and when it shuts down, is a lot of those FEMA people are recalled and can't work. So let's say I need a certain policy, a rule from, a legal rule on a specific policy dealing with public assistance. There's nobody in DC to answer my question. So that's, it kind of holds us up in that way. But day-to-day -day operations when it comes to individuals, and things like that, we will not, you know, stop helping or assisting individuals. Other questions? Yes. Um, how has work on recovery from Hurricane Florence um, still working at present day, or how is how are how is like organizations like FEMA continuing to help people recover from Hurricane Florence? Yeah, that's a good. How are people? How is uh, FEMA assisting? Well, they're working with us on a daily basis. They're, you know, if they're providing funds. You know, uh, without FEMA, uh, the state of North Carolina, we wouldn't have the funds to to operate uh, the recovery disaster, uh, or it would really impact our uh, economy. FEMA helps with that tremendously by paying 75%. 100% on certain housing items. So that helps tremendously. Uh, on infrastructure, they bring in experts, they bring in engineers. If I need, let's say, uh, one of the things that I'm responsible for is building beaches back. You may not like that, you may say, well, that's a waste. But beaches bring into the state of North Carolina a tremendous amount of sales and tax revenue. It is a business. And without that business, our coastal communities <coughs> would be severely impacted. FEMA, if I need a beach tack, I can bring in a beach tack or a technical advisor. If I need an engineer to help me with a special culvert project, I can bring in somebody to help me. So FEMA helps a lot. Other questions? Yes? Do you think there's enough awareness in the community as far as preparation or like what, how we can get involved afterwards? You know, uh, Brent's better at answering that than I am because I think every community is strong, has good strengths and, and, and bad. And we're only as good as our own community. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, part of my job is also to go out and, and educate people on how to be prepared. So are we 100% of that? No, there is more awareness that needs to be uh, shared with people. Um, volunteerism, volunteerism ha has declined across uh, the nation, not just in, in Nash County, not just in North Carolina. Uh, so people being prepared uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that they're as prepared as they can be, but getting that word out can be difficult at times. And we've got to know how and how we can reach out to people. Social media, is it face-to-face? -face? How can we get that word out? Uh, you know, we always use the slogan, the first 72 hours are on you. you got to be prepared for the first 72 hours after a disaster. And that's not only individually and family, but as a county, I've got to be ready and be, be prepared to maybe be on my own for 72 hours before the state or any other resources might be able to come in. Because Hurricane Matthew was a good example 
uh, I'm sorry, Hurricane Florence was a good example because it was so big and it was out there at sea uh, fishing around, so to speak, and didn't know which way it was coming, that we did not move resources like we usually do. Uh, so we had to leave the resources where they were until we had a more definite uh, idea of where that that storm was going to go and then so there, there were some areas that you know had to be on their own for a few hours before we could get those resources moved so we can do a better job we always can do a better job at, at trying to make sure everybody is prepared trying to get the word out so that's always going to be a I don't know that we'll ever get over top of that curve well we're always going to stay at the top of the curve uh, trying to, to keep advancing with that other okay. questions? Yes. So you mentioned that you were underfunded. Has there ever been like has there ever been a situation in which you wanted to delegate a certain amount of resources to one um, disaster, but you had to like sacrifice certain resources so that everyone could have help? No, it's, you know it's not really that. You got uh, when I say I'm underfunded or we're underfunded, it's because sometimes the need is greater than the grant. You know, uh, the public assistance program is a federal grant. The individual assistance program, step program, is a grant. Hazard mitigation is a grant. So you only receive a certain amount of money. And you've got to figure out the greatest, you know, aspects of that. You, we're not taking, you know, from somebody else and giving it to somebody. It's just that the the rims of the grant, there is so much more that we can do sometimes. So you can't spend certain allocated money on other... Right. I can't take the public assistance dollars and give it to individuals. I can't take individual assistance dollars and give it to, you know, outside the guidance. Because I have to be responsible for state... I get audited by the state every year. We get audited by the federal government every year. Um, if we have a finding, we may, the state of North Carolina may have to pay back the money. Okay. Yes? I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. If there was a flood, you know, if you see a flood coming up around here, how many people do you need to prepare for, like, for How many do I think are going to need help? I mean, like, 